Well, good morning. Welcome to Union Center Church of the Brethren. We're glad to have you here, whether you're here in person or be joining us a little bit later. We're just glad you're here and able to share together as we praise and worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. At this time, our worship team will lead us. As we do our candle lighting, the light of God is shining. Are we too busy to see it? The light of God is shining. Are we too distracted to share it?
The light of God is calling. Are we too self-absorbed to turn aside to see what this great wonder might be? Please join me now in our responsive psalm. O oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on God's name. Make known these deeds among the peoples. Sing to the Lord. Sing praises. Tell of all God's wonderful works. Glory in God's holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the strength of the Lord. Seek God's presence continually. Remember God's wonderful works, miracles, and judgments, and remember our history together. We are God's offspring. We are the family of the Lord. We remember our history as a nation of slaves set free. God sent us leaders in those times when we needed them. God strengthened us as a people. Praise the Lord. Let us go before God in our morning prayer. What is this great wonder that calls us? The dry bush is burning in the hot desert, yet it is not consumed. God's great love for us pleads with us to step away from destruction. Will we, like Moses, step out of our way to see what this great wonder is all about? Or will we, or will we too preoccupied with our plans for each day, put off again and again the discipleship to which we are called. People of God, Jesus calls us to pick up our cross and follow. Let us walk forward, wounded healers all, seeking to support and encourage each other, beginning here in this place. We are surrounded by miracles and wonders. When we share the word of God, we become wonders as well. Bless us, God of light, God of fire, God of hope. This we pray in your mighty name. Amen. Well, at this time, we'll invite the children to come forward for our children's time. Good morning. Why don't you sit right down there, because I'm going to have you look at something up there. Good morning. I want you to look up there, and I don't know if, if Reagan can see or not. The picture of the lady, can you see the picture of the lady? Right there. She's a very, it's a beautiful picture and a beautiful lady. Vlad and Zhenya brought that all the way from Ukraine for us because it was very special. And they wanted to share that with us. And I thought it was a very pretty picture. But then I found out something. That picture is on fabric. You know, like I, material. I have a little fabric bag here, and it has a picture of some birds on it. They're kind of like folded origami. Like origami. Mm-hmm, that's right. And so the picture is on here. The picture of the lady is on cloth like that. And I didn't know that. Jenya filled me in on that. But there's something of else very, very special about that that I didn't know until I looked at it up close. Do you see something a little bit different in this picture when you see it up close? What do you see, shiny. Bailey? It's what? Shiny. It's shiny. You're right. What it is, somebody who was very talented, much more talented than I, took a needle and thread and some little beads. Now, my, the beads I have here are bigger. These are very, very, very tiny. And they sewed those on there 
to make the picture even more special than I thought it was. Maybe some other of you noticed that. I had not noticed that. And you know, that's kind of like when uh, that God made each one of you very, very special. God knows all the very special parts about you, just like this picture has some very, very special parts. Um, God made you very special, but you know what? God made the people that you see very special too. We might not be special in the same way, but God made us so that we are unique. When I first looked at it, I didn't know how really wonderful it was. When you first meet somebody, you may not know all of the special things about them either. But once you get to know them, you will see the special way that God made them. And God loves each one of us. Let's say a prayer. Dear God, thank you that you made each one of us unique and special. Help us to look for those special parts in everybody that we meet. Amen. Okay. Amen. Amen. That's right. Let me get this. And we'll But he can look at it up close after, at, not now, <laughs> after a while. Well, this time I'd like to invite Rich Walter to come forward. Rich, it's been a joy to have you here in our congregation from the moment you walked in some months ago and introduced yourself and made yourself at home because this is your church home. And we're glad to have you with us here today. Today you are being received back into the membership of the Union Center Church of the Brethren. And this family, your family, are glad to be able to welcome you again as a full member of our congregation. Uh, it is our intention to surround you with loving fellowship, the means of grace, the opportunity for worship, study, service, and spiritual nurture. You are already counted a responsible, working, growing, witnessing member of Christ Church. In the name of the church, I welcome you. Now... Rich was baptized not once but twice, uh, originally at the Salem Mennonite Church, and then when he wandered into the Brethren Circle, they thought just to make sure they, they dunked him three times. <laughs> and uh, he doesn't seem to have been harmed by it in the least. But, uh, uh, but you well know the significance of our baptism, which is an outward sign of an inward commitment to Christ and the church. And so I simply ask you, reminding you that at the time of your baptism, you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you proposed to live according to the teachings of the New Testament, and you proposed to be a faithful member of the body of Christ, and you've done those things. So I ask you simply this, do you renew your commitment to Christ, to the church, and to our fellowship? Amen. Well, let's just have a prayer now. <sighs> Gracious Lord, we give you thanks and praise for, for Rich's rock-solid wisdom, his foundation of a life of commitment and service, and the blessings he, br he brings just with his smile, his handshake, and his willingness to be a part of our church. Please bless him as he continues in this pilgrimage with us together. Watch over all of us and give us strength 
as we continue to serve you lovingly, willingly, and gladly. And Lord, these things we pray in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Welcome. And make sure you say welcome too later. Yeah. Oh. And Rich, I forgot to hand you this. I'm going to run after you here. <laughs> Our prayer focus this week is grandparents. I'm a grandparent now, and I'm, I'm hoping I'm leaving behind a couple of lessons that will last a lifetime. I know I learned a lot from my grandparents, uh, my father's mother and my mother's father. The other two died before I was born. Now, Grandma Mary was born in Mexico and crossed the border with her family when she was 10 years old. And she would stay with us when my mom was in the hospital having another baby. <sighs> now, Grandma Mary didn't speak much English, and as she got older, she spoke it less and less. But uh, sometimes one of us kids would fall, we'd scrape a knee or an elbow. Uh, we expected Grandma would put some mercurochrome or methylate on our cuts and a Band-Aid. Instead, she'd wave her hand over the sore and recite, Sana, sana, colita de rana. Si no sana soy, sana ras mañana. It's a little nonsense rhyme that means healthy, healthy. The little frog had gas. <laughs> That's what it means. If you're not well today, you'll be fine tomorrow. <laughs> In other words... Things are not that bad. You'll be fine. And you know what? That was a very good lesson to learn. Not everything is the end of the world. Now, I'd like everybody here to get up, walk around, and share something. Is there a lesson that you learned from a grandparent, a life lesson that stuck with you? Is there a lesson you've taught or would like to teach your grandchildren, past, present, or future? Okay. Discuss among yourselves.
Well, I would, I would invite you to continue to share uh, during our carry-in following worship. So, uh, and don't forget, if for some reason, you know, you forgot uh, to bring something for the carry-in, there's always more than we know what to do with. But, uh, yeah, you can share some more and pick somebody else to tell that story to. But now that we're back, let's remember to pray for grandparents grandchildren, and grandpeople who do great things for kids, whether they, you know, are actually their grandparents or not. And just for practice, repeat after me. I think we're going to be, here we go. Sana, sana, colita de rana. Si no sanas hoy, sanaras mañana. Don't worry, you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Frank. Our scripture this morning, we have scripture from Exodus and from Matthew. I'll start with the Exodus passage, and I'll be reading from the Inclusive Bible. Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jephro, the priest of Midian. Leading the flock deep into the wilderness, Moses came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The messenger of Yahweh appeared to Moses in a blazing fire from the midst of a thorn bush. Moses saw the bushes ablaze with fire. It is consumed. Moses said, let me go over and look at this remarkable sight and see where the bush doesn't burn up. When Yahweh saw Moses coming to look more closely, God, God called out to him from the midst of the bush, Moses, Moses. God an Moses answered, I am here. God said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I am the God of your ancestors, the voice continued, the God of Sarah and Abraham the God of Rebekah and Isaac, the God of Leah and Rachel and Jacob. Moses hid his face, afraid to look at the Holy One. Then Yahweh said, I have seen the affliction of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries under those who oppress them. I have felt their sufferings. Now I come down to rescue them from the hand of Egypt, out of their place of suffering, and bring them to a place that is wide and fertile, a land flowing with milk and honey, the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. The cry of the children of Israel has reached me, and I have watched how the Egyptians are oppressing them. Now go, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and lead the children of Israel out of Egypt? God answered, I will be with you, and this is the sign by which you will know that it is I who have sent me to you. After you bring my people out of Egypt, you will all worship at this very mountain. But, Moses said, when I go to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of our ancestors sent me to you. If they ask me, What is this God's name? What am I to tell them? God replied, I am as I am. This is what you tell the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God spoke further to Moses. Tell the children of Israel... Yahweh, the I Am, the God of your ancestors, the God of Sarah and Abraham, Rebekah and Isaac, of Leah and Rachel and Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is a name you are to remember for all generations. And now from our other passage from Matthew. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to the disciples that he must go to Jerusalem to suffer many things at the hand of the elders, chief priests, and the religious scholars. And he must be killed, and on the third day raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Rabbi, he said. This will never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get yourself behind me, you Satan. You are trying to make me stumble and fall. You are setting your mind not on the thing of God, but of mortals. Then Jesus said to the disciples, If you wish to come after me, you must deny your very selves. Take up the instrument of your own death and begin to follow in my footsteps. If you would save your life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you will find it. What profit would you show if you gained the whole world but lost yourself? What can you offer in exchange for your very self? The promised one will come in the glory of Abba God, accompanied by the angels, and will pay all according to their conduct. The truth is, some of you standing here will not taste death before you see the coming of the promised one, the promised one's reign. Amen.
Well, it was a busy week at the National Older Adult Conference, as we politely put it, uh, at uh, Lake Junaluska in North Carolina. Uh, it was a, also a fun time getting together with a lot of folks after four years. Uh, I'm uh, Jenny and I are on staff, and so uh, we have a lot of fun, but we keep pretty busy. But I at least got an afternoon off in the middle of the week and uh, went hiking with uh, uh, a, a group of people. There was a, an easier hike and a medium hike and a rougher hike, and none of them were all that bad and none of them were all that easy. But it, but it was uh, a lot of fun to be up there in the Smoky Mountains uh, uh, after a rather harrowing bus, bus ride when uh, we took up both lanes up and down the hill. Uh, either way, uh, the, the path itself, until we got up to the end where we were sort of doing a little rock climbing, was mostly a matter of keeping your eyes on your feet and not looking up because there were so many roots sticking up everywhere that it would have been very easy to trip. Uh, we successfully got up to the upper falls, which was our goal, took pictures, began the trip down, and there were some of us in the front, and we were mostly watching our feet, but somebody had the good sense to look up on this road, and uh, then we all stopped because there was a five-foot uh, rattlesnake, really fat uh, uh, rattlesnake right in the middle, and just to make sure that we knew that she was a rattlesnake, she was rattling her rattle which is a way of saying, don't tread on me. Uh, we all stopped short, uh, and because we'd seen some kids going partway on the path and maybe coming back, uh, little kids with their parents, we managed it with a branch to get it to go quite a bit off the path and go on its way. But on the way, while we were walking, watching our feet and keeping our eyes on what we were doing, uh, some of us began to recite the poem by Robert Frost, uh, The Road Less Traveled. Um, back in the day when, when people memorized poems and recited them at school, um, uh, maybe because that was handy since in those days there was no phone to look up and get the exact wording of the poem, uh, we were reciting snippets of it. Uh, Robert Fa Frost wrote a poem about how he was walking and came where the roads diverged, and, of course, there's symbolism. Maybe the road of life is converging. And, and one way looks very well traveled, and the other way looks very much less traveled. And you know, I had to think that you know, a lot of times we think, well, no problem. I'm at Cap Mac. I'm going to go this way today, but I'll go this other way tomorrow because you go maybe go there regularly. But there's times in our lives where we come to a divergence and we know this is the time we make a choice because we are not coming this way again. And as the poem concludes, he says, I shall be telling this with a sigh. And I don't trust myself to memorize it anymore. So, I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood and I, I took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference. And there are some scriptures I want to look at right now of what I would call the biblical road less travel, the pressures of the world, and maybe some churches tell us that this is the road we need to go down. But scripturally, maybe not. The first scripture I want to talk about is this very one um, uh, from Exodus uh, with Moses. You know, his was a road, a very hard and rocky road. Uh, he was born condemned to death as, as a Hebrew baby, and Pharaoh had decided that the midwives were to kill all male children who were born. And the midwives, who had the natural smarts that come to most women, had decided they would just simply lie about it. Nothing, nothing better to be said about it than that. You know, there's a time when telling a lie is the right thing. As uh, the writer Isaac Asimov once noted, never let your sense of morals prevent you from doing what is right. It's not in the Bible, but it ought to be. Anyway, they simply would help deliver the child and then say, those, he those Hebrew women, 
They give birth so fast we don't get there in time to help. A blatant lie. But So Moses is born under a sentence of death, and as you know, he's hidden in the basket in the uh, reeds there upon the Nile. He is seen by Pharaoh's daughter of all people and adopted and raised in royal household. He um, sees the affliction of his people and becomes a murderer, thinking he will deliver his people through murder, but his own people are not quite so sure that he's on their side. And off he goes, fleeing Egypt, becoming a shepherd in the desert when he sees this bush that is burning, and yet it is not consumed. And he has a job, and he's got to take care of the sheep, and they're not the brightest animals in the world. As my professor Don Dernbaugh used to say, he didn't like being compared to a, shepherd, a sheep of the flock since, he's, since growing up. He said, sheep don't always make the best choices without a human being to help them out. So he has the road that he's meant to travel, but he asks himself, should I turn aside and take a look at this bush? He takes the road less traveled. And I've got to think several occasions. He must have thought, I should not have gone there. Because it meant being commissioned to confront Pharaoh, to lead a recalcitrant people out into the desert, to follow a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, to have the presence of the Holy of Holies in the tent, to lead the people across the Red Sea that has been parted, to be responsible to, his, to assist in miracles and to get as far as Mount Horeb and to stand upon the heights and look upon at the promised land and never step over into it. That came from turning this way. And yet, that is where we encounter the God I am. Instead of being told, Oh, yeah, this is the God of thunder and lightning. This is the God of fertility and, and corn and wheat growing. This is the God of wind and rain. We're told, no, this is the God I am. And you will know the God I am only if you take this path less traveled and walk with I am. Then you will know the nature of this God who is with us in good times and bad. You will only meet, you will only walk, you will only become who you are if you get out of your tracks. And there you will encounter the great I am. I, we saw the road less traveled, and normally I watch the services I miss because I'm on a trip or vacation on YouTube, but I was so busy last week that I still have it. I want to warn you that this text is taken directly from what Mark preached last week. You know enough, we've been together long enough to know that if I disagree with Mark, go with Mark. <laughs> you know, science professor, humanities major, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's a no-brainer there. But I want to suggest, among other things, whatever else Mark may have suggested about this passage, is that is that Paul is showing people in the Roman Empire, and especially Christians in Rome, the heart of the empire, where your status is everything, where you want to make it clear that you are this high on the social scale, which means you're better than everybody else, and that you never show humility to people you identify as your inferiors but that you continue to claw your way upward so that you have even more people to look down on. That Paul says there is a road less traveled. Love should be shown without pretending. He says in Romans 12, verse 9, hate evil, and then later love each other like members of the family. Oh, if you're not a member of my family, you're just not as good as all of us. You know, Romans had three names, a clan name, a family name, and their personal name. They were very conscious of who they were related to and how it made them better than everybody else. And yet Paul says, be the best at showing honor to each other. These words are very similar to the words of Jesus, the words of the Hebrew scriptures, and the wisdom that the Christians shared. Be happy in your hope. Contribute to the needs of God's people 
and welcome strangers into your home. Uh, you know, that's very reminiscent of Hebrews 13, too. Always show hospitality to strangers, because in doing so, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Be happy with those who are happy. Cry with those who are crying. Consider everyone as your equal. Associate with people who have no status, just like the, just like the big feast that the rich person held. And when all the people with invitations didn't show up, they went out and brought in the poor, those with disabilities, the struggling and the suffering. Uh, and uh, where it says welcome, welcome strangers into your home, you know, the word there, when it comes to showing hospitality, is not just welcome. It's pursue, chase, bother them until they come into your home. Don't do it halfway. Don't say, well, if you're not doing anything else, I'd like you to come on by. You know, tell them, yes, I am having the Super Bowl party, and yes, you're coming, and yes, we're having guacamole, and yes, we're having dip, and yes, we're having six different kinds of wings. You know, really go after people to have them come. Don't just say, oh, yeah, come on over if you, if you want. Let me know if there's something I can do for you. And then I, um, but the last part is also important as well. If possible, to the best of your ability, live at peace with all people. To the best of your ability. You know what? It recognizes that there are some people who don't want to be happy. It recognizes that you, though you will pursue zealously to practice hospitality, if there's folks that are just not going to be happy about anything, don't go down with the ship. And that's important also. In the end, the misery of those who choose to be miserable cannot be allowed to hold us hostage because we are the heirs of joy. We are the heirs of good times and happiness. And though we're all suffering and we're all afflicted with something, and we've talked about any number of really difficult things that are happening among our larger church family. And we do need to sorrow with those who are sorrowing. We do so knowing that because we take the path less traveled, our destiny is a joy we share with everybody. Which brings us, finally, to the passage from Matthew, where Jesus talks about suffering talks about embracing the suffering of the cross, something on an obscene level that would have been incomprehensible to the Roman Empire to say that Jesus will willingly accept obediently an execution that is saved for the lowest of the low, the worst of the worst, in which not only is the memory of this person to be eradicated, but even the body is to disappear, thrown into a pit to be eaten by animals. And yet, Jesus was telling his disciples, we do suffer. Our destiny is joy. But suffering is part of what happens to us. And when some people try to tell you there's something wrong because you do suffer, or that it's somehow your own fault, or if only you had done A, B, or C, it wouldn't happen to you. As Jesus said, get behind me, you adversary. The word ha-satan in the Hebrew, the Satan, means the adversary. It means anybody who puts a roadblock. We cannot help that in this life, we will suffer in the ordinary course of the events. But it doesn't define who we are. It doesn't change our status with God and each other. And it is a burden that we can share joyfully, lovingly, and fully. And that is why we are a church family. Uh, we take that road less traveled. In some languages, there are no words for the kind of suffering people endure because they become non-people. They don't exist anymore. 
But we are called to show hospitality, to visit, to reach out to each other at the worst times because we have every intention of sharing the best of times and our Messiah has blazed the trail towards the cross and beyond into resurrection. And as he concludes, stop thinking human thoughts, pick up your cross and follow me. And so we follow on this road less traveled. Peter wanted Jesus to follow the path of glory, as would be normal in the Roman Empire, to, to seek greater and greater victories at the expense of others. But that reminded me of another poem, Thomas Gray in his poem, Elegy Written in a Country Churchyard. Some thoughts that came to him as he, as he looked out at a country church in England, saw the cemetery, and he wrote, the boast of heraldry, the pomp of power, and all that beauty, all that wealth ever gave, alike awaits the inevitable hour. The paths of glory lead but to the grave. The paths of glory lead but to the grave. Those things we think make us great in the eyes of the world those things that we seek after most amount to nothing in the end. As it says, what God values most is your humble and contrite heart and your willingness to take that road less traveled as a lifelong commitment as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Your eyes upon the heavens, but your heart with all who need you, serving in love and in joy, knowing that with Moses, with the Apostle Paul, with Jesus, and with the example of our own families and friends, true glory that leads beyond the grave to our heavenly reward comes with bearing each other's burdens, sharing each other's woes, and laughing in the, in the face of everything, knowing we are God's people and we are on our way. Amen. As we share together in our sermon hymn, you're welcome to stay seated and sing along, or to stay seated and just listen.
or offering statement, we are approaching a time of balance when day and night balance out, dark and light and equal measure rain. We travel on the east-west roads at sunrise and sunset. We're driving directly into sunlight at dawn and dusk. Regardless of the length of the day or the temperatures or the type of task awaiting us on any particular day, we will eat and sleep, cook and clean, dress and go about our daily tasks. The quality of these tasks are affected by the season, but nevertheless, nevertheless, life calls us and continues. In our lives of faith, we also have times of darkness and light. We perceive God clearly and other times when God seems hidden. In the midst of all times, we act faithfully, regardless of the spiritual season we find ourselves in. Our lives of faith are marked by prayer, praise, scriptures, offerings, service, and sometimes simply in doing nothing at all. Let us continue to serve God and God's people in each season and in each change, faithfully, joyfully, and fearlessly. Let us go in prayer. Receive these offerings, God revealed in light, nor hidden in shadow, and, in, and present in all the moments of our days. Whether it is visible to us or not, we trust that you will guide each offering to an appointed task of your choosing in a time that best suits your will. Hear our prayer, guide our days, bless our lives. Amen. And now for our benediction. May God's light, burning bright, call us in day or night. May we turn from our path to hear your call and find your will in our lives. Amen. This song of worship team will lead us. <laughs>